Hello everyone, I am Anoop. I work with the Freiburg Galaxy team in Germany. In this talk, we will discuss about classification and different approaches used for classification. In the previous talk about introduction to machine learning, we briefly discussed what is classification. We just have a recap here. In classification tasks, class is a category. In a data set, there can be multiple classes, and these classes can also be called as categories. And these categories are represented as integers, such as 0, 1, 2, or 3, or, or more. We saw that in the previous talk that machine learning has two different um, variants, supervised learning and unsupervised. In supervised learning, we have outputs or classes for each data point in our data set. Therefore, we have supervision of classes. And our classifiers learn to map the features with the classes. And when a new sample comes in, it tries to predict uh, using the model, the class of the new sample. There can be two kinds of classification. One is binary, where there can be only two classes. For example, it can be cancer or no cancer. Cancer can be represented as zero and no cancer can be represented as one. Similarly, we can have spam or no spam classes for spam filtering task. In addition to binary classification, we can have multi-class classification as well. In this, data set can have more than two classes. For example, in handwriting digit recognition data set, there can be 10 classes and each class belongs to a digit. For example, 0, 1, 8, 7, and so on. On the right, we can see uh, two images and we can see it's a binary classification problem. The red crosses belong to one class and blue circles belong to another class and then we learn a boundary which is a linear classifier and we see they are separately nicely separated on the right we can see that there are some outliers uh, for the second class and the the decision boundary gets tilted a bit let's look at the linear model in linear model or linear classification, we learn a linear or a straight line, a linear curve. The input data point X in the image can be represented as two features, X1 and X2. Our classifier, the linear classifier learns weights for these features, which can be represented as W1 and W2. There's another component of weight, which is called bias and is represent, represented as W0. This W0 is the intercept of the straight line. And W1 and W2 and W are the feature coefficients. Using these all information, X1, X2, the X vector and the weight vector and the intercept, we can define a function Y, which is a straight line. Y equal to zero gives the decision boundary. If y is greater than zero, then the input data, for example, x here is assigned to class one. And if it is less than zero, then it is assigned to class two. In, in real life, not all data sets can be separated uh, by linear classifiers. We need more complicated classifiers. One of the nonlinear classifiers is support vector machine. Yes, uh, support vector machine is also linear. It has a linear variant as well, but also nonlinear variants for learning nonlinear curves. Support vector machine is a maximal boundary, maximum margin classifier. What it means is it learns a decision boundary, which is maximally separated by the nearest samples belonging to two classes. On the top image, we can see that y equal to zero is a decision boundary. And we have uh, three data points, two data points uh, on the line y equal to one. 
this these data points belong to class one and another data point um, <clears throat> with the y equal to minus one belongs to another class. We can see that the decision boundary y equal to zero is equally separated um, by both both of both set of points and having the maximum margin between these two points. We need only support vectors. These uh, nearest data points to the decision boundary are called support vectors. And for classifying a new data point, we need only these support vectors. Other data points can be thrown away. This is one of the advantages of support vector machines. For example, when a new data point, uh, which is colored as blue comes in, then <clears throat> we say that uh, this belongs to class one because it falls on the right of y equal to one line, which belongs to class one. In the bottom image, we can see that the nonlinear variant of support vector machines. The dark black line gives a nonlinear curve separating the blue and the red circles, crosses, sorry. And the circled ones, these are the support vectors belonging to two different classes. There are other nonlinear classifiers, such as nearest neighbor classifiers. In these kind of classifiers, we need to define a certain number of neighbors. How many neighbors uh, a data point can have, for example, five or seven or 15. These neighbors are computed based on a distant metric. This distant metric can be Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, or some other distant distance measure. When a new data point comes in, then the class of this new data point is determined by the maximum number of classes, maximum number of neighbors having the same class. In the image, we can see that uh, the green data point is, our, is a new data point and three of its neighbors are also defined, two are red and two have red class and one is blue. Therefore, the class of this new data point would be red triangle. One of the examples of nearest neighbor is K nearest neighbors, where K defines the number of uh, the neighbors. Uh, <clears throat> we need to define the number of neighbors before, uh, before learning this model. One of the advantages of nearest neighbor is that it learns any kind of boundary, any irregular boundary, which can separate classes. But there are different downsides of the nearest neighbor approaches because it stores training data. Storing training data when it is too large becomes intractable. Therefore, with a very big data set, it's hard to use nearest neighbor approaches. Another classifier is decision tree. On the right, we can see that a small decision tree is plotted. This data set uh, defines if a person is fit or not fit. This data set has uh, <clears throat> three features, age, whether a person eats pizzas or exercises in the morning. We define simple decision rules, for example, age less than 30. If it is age less than 30, then all the samples belonging to this category falls on the left side and all people with age greater than 30 fall on the right side. Then we use another feature, eating habit of pizzas. Then we separate the training samples again into two parts. We say that if a person is eating a lot of pizzas, if yes, then all these samples belong to this category, they are unfit. And if no, they are fit. Similarly, the another feature is doing exercises in the morning. If people who do exercises in the morning and greater than and having age greater than 30, they are fit and People who don't do exercises in the morning with age greater than 30, they are unfit. These are the simple decision rules. Um, decision tree learns from the data itself. 
and the splitting based on each feature is done at each node, which we saw in this example. And at the, at the labels, the labels are present at the leaf nodes, which we see at the bottom. Let's discuss advantages and disadvantages of decision trees. As we saw in the example on the right, that is very easy to understand. We have simple decision rules, for example, age less than 30, and then we divide our training data into two parts. It follows logical order and very simple to understand. Another advantage of using decision trees is that we can use it with categorical data for predicting classes and also with numerical data. Prediction using decision trees is logarithmic in the number of data points. What it means is when we have a trained model using decision trees, then prediction takes less time because we just need to follow only one path to classify uh, the unseen data sets. With these advantages, decision trees also have some disadvantages as well. One of the disadvantages is overfitting. Decision trees can be over complex, which makes it prone to overfitting, which means that it learns very good on the training data, having high accuracy, but it performs poor on unseen data sets. Another disadvantage is that its performance can have high variance, which means that if the data set changes little, then the entire decision tree can be different. For example, in training and test data sets, if they have slight differences, then we can get very different results. Another disadvantage of using a decision tree is if our data set is imbalanced in the number of classes, for example, uh, if one class is dominant and another class is not, then these decision trees can be very biased towards the dominant class. To avoid overfitting, we can use uh, simple techniques such as uh, pruning the decision tree or setting the maximum depth of the tree. To avoid creating bias trees, uh, we should always balance our data set and then use decision trees on them. To avoid high variance in our results, we can use not only one decision tree, but, but multiple decision trees, which gives rise to our next uh, model, which is ensemble model. Ensemble method takes several models into account and then makes prediction by taking the performance of all the models. It combines multiple tree estimators. As we can see in the image, we have data and the data is passed into different models. And each model gives a prediction and then we take the majority voting for predicting the class of a new sample. There are two approaches for ensemble method. One is bagging, another is boosting. In bagging method, several estimators are trained uh, at the same time and they are independent of each other and because of this independence, these estimators can be trained in a parallel way, which gives a huge uh, performance boost in terms of runtime. Examples of bagging approach is bagging classifier, random forest classifier. Another approach of ensemble method is boosting. In boosting, we have a few estimators which are called weak learners and these estimators are improved sequen sequentially since uh, these estimators uh, don't work independently of each other there can be no parallel execution examples of using boosting approach is ada boost classifier gradient tree boosting and there is another one is extra gradient boosting trees in this talk, we learned about classification in general, and we learned uh, 
different techniques used in classification from linear to non-linear ones. Linear ones, we saw that uh, it learns a straight line and it has two attributes, intercept and the weights, which are also called coefficients. The non-linear methods include SVM, which has linear and non-linear variants. Then we have nearest neighbor approaches. And then we have decision trees, which learn simple decision rules, but it has some disadvantages, which can be overcome using ensemble method. Ensemble methods use uh, different models uh, and they, these models work together to produce the prediction for a new sample. Thank you. Hello, everyone. In the presentation about classification, we learned basics of classification and different techniques to do classification. Classification is a task of classifying a data point into separate classes. For example, cancer or no cancer, spam or no spam. There are different ways of doing uh, classification through different algorithms. They can be linear or nonlinear depending on the data. Sometimes the data can be classified using linear classifiers, but many times it's possible that data cannot be classified using straight lines. They need, uh, they need different uh, nonlinear curves to differentiate between different classes. In this session, we will be doing a hands-on on classification. We will be using a data set and Using that data set, we will classify samples into different classes and we will visualize the results. Before doing that, let's make ourselves familiar with Galaxy's uh, training materials website. Let's go to uh, training.galaxyproduct.org. In this, we will find a variety of tutorials. To find the relevant tutorial for this session, we should go to statistics and machine learning section. In this section, we go to its specific page. And inside, we will find different training materials related to machine learning and deep learning. In this list, we should use classification in machine learning tutorial. We will find the tutorial under the hands-on category. We will just click on it and it will open the tutorial that we will be using for the hands-on session. For doing hands-on session, we need Galaxy application. Let's open in another browser tab, usegalaxy.eu. It looks like this. You have uh, different tools on the left side and you have history on the right side. History contains all the data sets that we will use and create while doing the hands-on session. On the left side in the tool section, we will have different machine learning tools. We'll be using some of those. We have already learned what is classification. In this tutorial, we will learn what kind of data set we can use for classification. We will use one specific data set from Chemi Informatics. We will apply on this data set, we will apply different machine learning algorithms such as logistic regression, which is a linear classifier. Then we, can, we will apply K nearest neighbor classifier, then support vector machines, and then ensemble algorithms such as random forest bagging. After each run of algorithm, we will plot different uh, plots to visualize how good we are doing and how we can analyze the classification results. As we already know that classification is a supervised learning approach, and therefore, the data set that we will be using will have at least two classes defined. In this particular tutorial, we will cover the data sets and what does it mean 
why this data set is useful. Then we'll fetch these data sets from Zenodo. Then we will apply several algorithms, which are classifiers on this data set. First of all, we will apply logistic regression. We will, we will train our model and then we will predict on the test data set. And then we will visualize uh, the results using different plots and see how good we are doing. Then we will apply K nearest neighbor classifier, then support vector machines, then random forest. In the introduction to machine learning part, we, we saw that hyperparameter optimization is very important uh, to find optimal learning accuracy. Therefore, we will also learn how to apply uh, one hyperparameter search technique using the same data. And with that, we will be concluding the tutorial. Classification, as we have discussed uh, several times, is, uh, is finding a curve. It can be a straight line or nonlinear, which can differentiate between different classes of data. In the, in the image we can see here, a straight line divides the class, classes into class one and class two. In real time, it can be that the straight line can be a nonlinear curve. The classification that we will be doing will be on two steps. First, we'll build the classifier, and then we will apply the trained model on a data set and try to predict the classes. The data set that we are using here comes from chemistry. This data set follows the principle of quantitative structure activity relationship with biodegradation. What does it mean? This quantitative structure activity relationship is also called quasar. So this quasar actually <clears throat> contains data sets of different molecules. And we try to map all these molecules to its biodegradable nature. Quasar in general tries to find the mapping between the chemical structure of the molecule and it associates the structure with the biological effect it produces. The chemical structure is defined using different molecular descriptors. For example, molecular weight, number of nitrogen atoms, number of carbon, carbon double bonds, number of hydrogen atoms, num number and position of different elements. These are the features of this data set. And using these features, the structure is defined. These features are then mapped to its biodegradable nature, whether a particular structure gives give a particular chemical compound a biodegradable nature or not. This data set has 1055 molecules. To apply classification on this data set, we will be using scikit-learn machine learning uh, algorithms which are present in Galaxy and there are different uh, plotting tools as well which we will be using for visualization of the results. Before, before going further, let's go to Galaxy. Let's open Galaxy. Use Galaxy.eu application we'll be using for our hands-on tutorial. Before doing anything, let's first create a new history in Galaxy. For doing any analysis in general, it's always good to create a new history so that all the analysis is saved in one history. And if you want to look at it at a later time, it will be easier to look at the whole analysis. Let's give it a meaningful name to it, classification, um, 
now we see that it's an empty history and no data sets are present here. We go back to the tutorial and see what kind of data sets uh, we need to import. In this particular section, get train and test data sets. There is information about different data sets that are needed for doing this tutorial. These files are present as links. As we can see here, there are three links to three different files. These files are also present at Zenodo. We can open the link from here and we can see all these three files are present here. To make it easier, the downloading of these data sets, we just copy uh, these links here, either, either by selecting or by just clicking on copy. Then we will go to Galaxy and we will do upload data. Using this, we can upload um, all the required data sets into our history. Then we will go to paste and fetch data. Since we have the links, it will pull the data from internet. We go to this text area and we just paste all the links here. Then we need to see whether we need to define all the data types of all the data sets. Since uh, we don't have any other information, we will just import all the data sets. If you need to check the data types of each data set, you can set it here. There are different data sets loaded um, in this dropdown and we can set either we can set it individually or we can set for all the all the data sets that we are uploading. Here, auto detect is already selected. We just uh, start the analysis, uploading the data sets. <clears throat> we see that um, based on these three links, uh, three data sets are getting created. It takes some time to, to upload these data sets. Meanwhile, we go to the tutorial and see what else we need to do. The third point says that uh, we should rename these data sets. As we see in these links, uh, the data set has uh, all the links included in the names as well, which is not so meaningful. Therefore, it's good um, <clears throat> to rename these data sets. So just now, uh, data sets became green, which means that all these are actually uploaded and uh, we can use them. Before turning green, uh, we saw that uh, all these data sets were yellow, which means that uh, the job to upload, upload these data sets were already running. And now when it, they are green, it means uh, they got finished. To rename the data sets, we need to go to each data set and click on the pencil icon, which says edit attributes. We go to this particular page and then click on data types. To change the data type, we can choose a different data type, but since our data is already in a tabular format, we don't need to do that. We go to attributes again, and then just uh, remove these links here and get a meaningful name for our data set. We do it for all the three data sets. Now uh, we have renamed all our data sets and they are meaningful and we will rem remember them easily. Here we can see a tip for renaming the data set, which is helpful. Now we will use a linear classifier for <clears throat> learning a a model. This linear classifier 
learns a straight line which differentiates between two classes. To apply these linear classifier, we need to go to Galaxy again and try to find this particular algorithm. To do that, uh, we should look at this hands-on section here, which says uh, the tool's name is generalized linear model. In this, we just copy this name from here and we go to Galaxy and in the search toolbox, we paste it here. Then Galaxy will search for the particular tool <clears throat> and we just found this tool and we click on it. When we click on it, we see the definition of the whole tool and uh, to search for a linear model, we need to see uh, which linear model we need. We need a logistic regression model. We just select it here. And now, first of all, we are doing a training a model task. We first need to train a model and then we can use uh, the predicted model. Here we have two types, train a model and load a model. Right now we will use train a model. We go back to the tutorial and see if we have chosen the right uh, parameters. We choose a linear method at logic regression. Our data is tabular type. And we see training samples data set. We go to the history and see <clears throat> which maps uh, this particular option. So the train rows actually maps it. And we go to train rows and select it here. That's why it's very important um, to keep meaningful names to our data set so that it's easier to map uh, to the tool. Now, the other option is does the data set contain header? We go to the data set and see if there are headers defined. These headers are actually the column names. We can see that uh, there are column names uh, in these data set and we need to notify to the algorithm that uh, there are some header names present in the data set. As we know that um, machine learning algorithms do not work on text, therefore the algorithm will actually exclude it. We say that yes, the headers are present. <clears throat> now, first of all, we need to divide these data sets, uh, the training data set into features and labels. To select all the features, what we need to do, this particular data set contains all the columns, which the last column is the label. To select all the features, we need to have only 41 columns and the 42nd column is the class, which we don't need uh, when we are selecting all the features. Therefore, we will choose an option, all columns excluding some column header names which says that take all columns except the excluded column name. Therefore, the excluded column name would be, would be class. We go back to the tutorial and see if we are doing the right thing. We are doing, we are selecting the train rows and the data set contains header, which is yes. And we have chosen the right um, options for selecting all the features. Now, we need uh, the labels information from the training data set. Therefore, we choose the same data set and data set also contains header again. Now, <clears throat> we need to choose only one column, which is the class column. Therefore, we will choose the option select columns by column header name. And here we will use the same column name as class which will select just one column, which is the target. We go to the tutorial again and then see we have chosen the right options. <clears throat> After that, we will execute this tutorial. It takes some time to finish this model. 
we see that um, as long as uh, this job is gray, which means it is not queued, once it becomes yellow, um, it starts running. We also see that um, we have chosen the tool uh, generalized linear model, and then we chose the algorithm logistic regression, and therefore we already have some meaningful name for this particular model. Alternatively, we can use logistic regression model as the name of this model once the job is finished. To refresh this history, we can just click on the refresh button. We still see the job has not started uh, running. <clears throat> we can wait a bit. And meanwhile, um, we can try to answer uh, this particular question. What is learned by the logistic regression model? We go to the solution and see <clears throat> the logistic regression model uh, is a linear linear model and it learns the coefficients of the, the straight line curve, which demarcates uh, the boundary between two classes. We go to Galaxy and see that uh, our job has started running as, as it has turned yellow. We go further. In this particular section, uh, we will use uh, the test data set to predict the classes using the model, which we will get very soon. To do that, we use the same tool, generalized linear model, which we used before for training the model. But right now, um, we will use a different option. We'll use load a model and predict option, which means that it will load the train model, which is the data set number four here. And then we will select uh, the test data with no class information. And then we will run this job. We see and verify if we we will be doing the right things, and we say that uh, we see that um, we are doing the right thing here. We selected the right model, and we selected the right data set here. Our data set still contains header. We can verify it here. The test rows. We again have header information, but right now we see there are only forty-one columns and. The class column is not present. And now we choose the option predict class labels and we just uh, execute this model. Once this task is over, once we have predicted the classes for the samples, we will visualize uh, the performance of the logistic regression classification results. Use, for doing that, uh, we need to use some plotting tools. Uh, the job has not started running yet. Uh, before uh, using the plotting tool, we will use a remove beginning tool, which removes um, the header from, from the data set it's a, still a test data set, but uh, without headers. We see that the job has started running and uh, we, we should rename this data set um, because we will be using uh, different algorithms uh, so that our data set is not lost. Uh, so therefore, we go to the pencil icon as before, and we just rename is at logistic regression results. We see that the data set got renamed here. We go to remove beginning tool to remove. Uh, we see that uh, it has finished. We will come back to it uh, in, in a minute. First, we try to find this remove beginning uh, of a file. 
and we will specify uh, test row labels. We specify remove first row and from the data set and we just run this tool. Meanwhile, uh, we will see um, this particular results table. We see that it's still a table, tabular data. And we see that we have now got 42nd column in this data set, which is the class information, the predicted class here. To see the performance of the logistic regression classifier, we will compare the true class with the predicted class and compare how many of the true classes have been predicted right. And we compute the accuracy based on that. Now our, this remove header job got finished and we just rename it as suggested in the tutorial. And now we will use a plotting tool which is plot confusion matrix precision and recall curves to verify the performance of our classifier. We found this tool here and we, we see that there are different options in this particular tool. First of all is uh, the input data file which contains the true class information. The second is the predicted uh, file containing predicted classes. And the third one is the train model, which we will use uh, <clears throat> for predicting uh, all the area under the curves uh, curves. We go back to the tutorial and we see um, input data file is test row labels, no header. This is this data set contains the true labels and the predicted data file is our logistic regression result and the model is automatically selected. Now we execute this. <clears throat> After executing this job, uh, we will get three different plots. First plot is the ROC and AOC curve. The second plot is precision recall curve. And the third one is confusion matrix curve. Since uh, as long as this job remains uh, unfinished, we can see the results already in the tutorial. First of all uh, is the confusion matrix. Confusion matrix gives gives a square matrix uh, between true class and uh, the predicted class labels. Using this, we can get information about how many of the true classes are actually predicted true and false. For example, in this particular plot, we have two classes, zero and one, this is predicted class levels on the x-axis and true class levels on the y-axis. Then if we look at one particular box, which is red in color, it says that uh, how many of the true class labels are predicted as, as zero? How many true zero class is predicted as zero? So each block here represents the number of samples which belongs to class zero and are also predicted as zero. So this block and the block here, which is actually true and also predicted as true. So these two blocks should be uh, containing a large number of samples compared to these two blocks here, which says that if it is like this, then we can say that the accuracy is high. Let's go to Galaxy and see. Uh, see, all our jobs got finished. And let's open the confusion matrix plot. So, so these plots are actually interactive plots. We can see uh, different values. 
So I just uh, increased the size of the, the screen uh, so that we can see the plots in a better way. The plots are actually big, so it takes a few seconds to open. Okay, uh, we will do it again. Ah, now it has come. So we see that um, it's the same plot. And if we hover over these, we can see uh, <clears throat> actual numbers. So X and Y both are zeros here in the black uh, tooltip. We can see here in the black tooltip here. And Z is 508, which means that 508 samples which have class zero are actually predicted as zero. When we go here, we see that uh, there are 228 samples which are actually belongs to class one are predicted as one. When we go here, the true class is zero and predicted class is one. And number of those samples is 55. And here it's 45. Let's learn about the relation between confusion matrix and precision recall curves. First of all, look at the precision recall curves. How do they look like? The, there are three straight lines in this curve, each belonging to uh, precision, which is blue in color, recall, which is red in color, and F score, which is green in color. These scores are given for each class. And all these classes we can see on the X axis here, the class labels, we have zero and one. And here is the score. These scores uh, can lie between zero and one. And zero is the worst score and one is the best score. Precision can be defined as a fraction of all the relevant results that we are getting for each class. Recall gives the fraction of all valid results we are getting for each class. And F score is the harmonic mean between precision and recall. The value of F score can vary between zero and one. If it is zero, it means that either precision or recall is zero. We go to the confusion matrix again and, and try to see how we can compute precision and recall. To compute precision for each class, we need to look at the true positives. True positives mean that the samples which are in class zero are also predicted as class zero. Then for true negatives, we say that it's true class is one, but it is predicted as zero. That's true negative. Using these two values, we can compute the precision. We can compute the fraction as follows, uh, 508 divided by 508 plus 55. That will give the precision for class zero, which is, which is, 0.90 for class for class zero. Similarly, we can compute the precision for class one as well, which is 0.83, as we can see in the plot. And we can also conclude that um, precision is a little bit higher for class zero compared to class one. Similarly, we can compute a recall as well. We go to confusion matrix, and <clears throat> now. The recalls formula is, is true positives divided by true positive plus false negatives. To do that, 
we take this particular box here and compute its number 508 and then we go to this box which gives false negatives and we compute the fraction as 508 divided by 508 plus 45 and this gives the recall for class zero and we go to the precision recall curve and then <clears throat> we can see that the recall is 0.91 percent similarly we can do it for class one as well and for f score we can compute uh, the harmonic mean between precision and recall which is given by the green line it is important to compute this plot um, to see the accuracy for each class which is important because uh, in real life data is is imbalanced in many cases and we always uh, should strive for uh, similar accuracy for each class if we are getting good accuracy for one class and not for the other class then um, it, it will be difficult uh, to predict on new samples then we get a third plot which is a area under the curve plot it gives uh, the accuracy another another measure of accuracy the roc curve here in shown by the blue line here for a good classification training this particular curve should be as left as possible should be near to near to one which is which is the case here and we also see that um, the AUC area under this curve is 94 we can say that the accuracy is 94 when this particular AUC curve is close to the red line which is chance and gives 50 percent accuracy then our classification is not that good or reliable therefore we should always uh, try to find uh, the ROC curve which is as close or as left as possible in this particular plot. It's actually a plot uh, between true positive rate versus false positive rate and we should always try to find uh, high true positive rates compared to false positive rates. We have seen all these three plots for logistic regression we'll be doing uh, the same plots for other classifiers as well since uh, we saw these plots and uh, we also discussed uh, all these plots and we can say that on the classification is acceptable we are getting around 90% uh, accuracy using further algorithms uh, can improve the the classification accuracy Maybe uh, the data is not uh, linearly separable. We may need to use uh, complicated algorithms such as nonlinear algorithms, SVMs, K, K nearest neighbor algorithms. We'll be looking at these algorithms soon. We have discussed uh, the K nearest neighbor algorithm briefly. The K in this uh, name defines the number of neighbors uh, a particular data point can have we cannot uh, <clears throat> keep uh, k very large otherwise it will slow down the algorithm and and also if we k if we keep k uh, very small then it may not give uh, reliable results therefore uh, we need to be able to find the right k for each uh, data set we are trying let's uh, do some hands-on for this particular algorithm to do that we need to find the right tool we will see the nearest neighbor classification and we will again re-enable the tool section and try to find this particular 
tool and we found it and then it has the similar definition as the tool before and we go to the the parameters and what parameters we need to select we need to select our nearest neighbors as a classifier type and then we need to select the train tabular data and then train rows we will do all these things as before we have training samples data set and we choose train rows our data set contains header we select it as yes our data set contains uh, feature columns as well as the class column. First of all, we will select all the features, excluding uh, the class. And uh, we just select class here. And uh, we have excluded the class and taken only the features. Now we need to select only the class labels we select the same data set which contains the class labels and our data set has headers we select the header and now we need to select only uh, the class column we will use this option select columns by header names and use the same header name as class we have done the same things again and we want to use k nearest neighbors as algorithm and then we use the same option and then we execute our model <clears throat> meanwhile uh, when our job is running we can see what are the advantages and disadvantages uh, of these algorithms it's it's a simple algorithm uh, it just tries to find um, the neighbors and try to classify based on the neighbors. It's a nonlinear algorithm. If uh, we have nonlinearity in the data, uh, it's useful and it can be used for classification problems and regression problems as well. And it works well with low dimensional data set. Um, since it keeps all the training data, and uh, if the dimensionality of the data becomes very high, then um, this algorithm may pose some problems because of the space. Um, we can see that it's one of the disadvantages uh, that it has high memory usage. Also, it suffers from a curse of dimensionality. If the dimensionality is too high, then, uh, then it's very hard to find uh, uh, the the right neighbors and the right classes for the new samples because uh, the curse of dimensionality uh, the problem is when you have too many features uh, compared to compared to the number of samples uh, we see that our job is completed then our model is ready and uh, then we can use this model uh, to predict the data set then we use the uh, again the same tool but in a different mode we use load and model and predict we have nearest neighbor classifier model which we just got it now and we select the test rows, uh, we need to select test rows here. And we have header in the data set. And then we execute this tool. Once this data set is finished, uh, we will be renaming it. There's again a question here. What is the value of K for the model? So in this particular definition of the tool, we have not set the value of K, the number of neighbors for the model. As uh, we have discussed before that, 
before that we are using scikit-learn algorithms. Therefore, scikit-learn algorithm gives uh, five number of neighbors as the default value. And we are using uh, five as the default value of number of neighbors. Now our job is running. Uh, therefore, we can change the name of this data set as nearest neighbor results. <clears throat> this value uh, may not be ideal for a problem. Therefore, it's important to find the right number of nearest neighbors for, for the problem and for the data. For simplicity, we have not set this particular parameter, but it's advisable to use different numbers depending on the data to find the optimal accuracy. Um, our prediction is finished. Then we use uh, the same tool for plotting. We have test row labels here. Yeah. Then we have predicted data file. And then we have the train model here. Just execute it. So <clears throat> we will get the three plots again as we got for the logistic regression approach. But uh, we will get different numbers in these uh, plots. As long as the job is not finished, we can see the results uh, in, in the tutorial itself. We can see the confusion matrix here and uh, for the precision recall curve and uh, ROC, AUC curve as well. So it's still not finished. So um, our jobs are, are running now and let's hope they finish soon. So down they are finished and we see that uh, the confusion matrix and precision recall and ROC curves are already present. Uh, let's just hide this particular tool section so that we have a bigger area. So um, we see that um, we have a slightly different results uh, with k nearest neighbors. So as we remember for class zero, we had 508 as uh, for the class level zero, but now we are getting 494. Then let's look at the precision and recall curve. So in this particular case as well, um, the precision uh, is a bit higher for class zero and precision is a bit lower for class one. That's why the overall precision uh, looks uh, a bit smaller. Um, yeah. Let's look at the ROC and AUC curves. Here we see that uh, the patterns, the pattern of the curve remains similar, and the AUC is 0.95. In the uh, in the last plot, uh, we got as got AUC as 0.94. So here it's a bit similar, I'd say. The performance is a bit similar. Uh, 
Now let's go to a different algorithm, um, which is SVM. We have discussed uh, before that SVM is a maximum margin classifier. It learns a boundary which is equidistant from the nearest samples in different classes. SVM has, uh, has both the variants. It can be linear and as it can be nonlinear as well. SVM is actually a very good uh, classifier for binary classification problems. And also uh, when the data is uh, nonlinear in nature. We will use uh, SVM techniques and we will use a linear version of support vector machines. Then first we need to find uh, SVM in our Galaxy tool suite. Let's find the SVM here. Let's go to the tool definition and we again choose a trainer model and now we are using uh, C, uh, linear support vector classification algorithm. Here there are two different uh, classification SVM classifiers which are nonlinear in nature. These can be used as well but uh, for simplicity we are using linear support vector classification. We have the same options, tabular data and uh, training samples data set. Before we will use train rows again. Our training data has headers and also columns, uh, feature columns as well as target columns. We will exclude the target column and uh, use only the feature columns. Therefore, we need to use the right header for the target, which needs to be excluded from the list of features. We use the same data set for the class labels as well. And we have the data set contain header and we select the column by header name. We have these. Let's see if we have chosen the right options. Uh, yes. Now we just uh, <clears throat> run this. So as we as we discussed uh, that we learn this maximal margin uh, for the for the SVM. Therefore, we learn the coefficients of the line with the maximum margin in the training phase. And using these, uh, we classify the new samples. So our job is running now. So as long as this job is running, we can try to set up the classifier for prediction. In that, um, we'll use the same tool again with in the predictor mode. We use the model. Uh, we already got the, the trained model and the data is test rows. Test rows here and data set contain headers and we want to predict class labels and then we run this. <laughs> Our job is running now and we can already rename this result coming from linear SVM. To see the uh, performance of SVM, we will use the same plotting tool. So our results are already ready. We use uh, input data file. It contains the true class labels and the predicted data file is the results from SVM. And we have 
the linear uh, support vector classifier as the train model. And then we execute it. It will generate um, again the three plots. And as long as they're not ready, um, we can see those plots here. So we have only one plot, um, ROC plot. So here we see that uh, the accuracy is, is 0.93 here, which I would say is still similar. It's still similar to, um, <clears throat> to what we have got before from logistic regression and K nearest neighbors. So we just verify the results. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we are getting a result as 0.94, which is similar um, in the tutorial, it's 0.93. Uh, I guess we are not setting uh, the seeds actually uh, to, to get the same results. So if we set the seeds in the algorithm, then um, we will get the same, same result. But these results, what we are getting for SVM and KNN and logistic regression, they're all same. Um, why is it so? In the introductory ML course, um, we discussed about hyperparameter optimization. There are several parameters um, of each algorithm. We need to tune them to get the optimal results. Uh, for example, if we tune the SVM, hy SVM's hyperparameters, maybe we get better results. Uh, maybe it's a task for uh, for the participants uh, to tune the parameters of support vector machines and see if we are getting the better results than 0.93. We will be using uh, hyperparameter techniques so that you will be familiar how to use those tools uh, to, to optimize on uh, the hyperparameters. And then you can do this task on your own to verify and learn. We see also the precision recall and this curve. We see that uh, the accuracy for the precision for class zero has decreased and the precision uh, for class one has increased. So it used to be 0.83, now it's 0.88. And this used to be 0 0.9, 0 0.9, but this has decreased to 0.87. We can see uh, how different um, classifiers can perform differently on the same data. We will use a random forest algorithm for classifying the Quasar data set. Till now, we have used uh, linear and nonlinear models for classifying the data. Now we will use an ensemble method for classification. Random forest, uh, we discussed it briefly that random forest uh, creates different uh, decision trees in parallel and the prediction is taken as an average prediction of all these uh, decision trees. That's why it's a forest, uh, it's not a tree because it includes many decision trees and takes prediction from all these decision trees uh, created independently and takes the average or majority voting. And by doing uh, this, this ensemble prediction, uh, it reduces uh, the randomness in the data, in the prediction. To apply this random forest algorithm to our data, we will find the ensemble method tool suite in Galaxy. So we have this tool here, ensemble methods. And again, we need to uh, train data set and we use a random forest classifier. In this list, uh, we have uh, many different classifiers. While discussing ensemble methods, we 
we discussed that there are two kinds of ensemble methods. One is based on boosting and another is based on um, bagging. So random forest is based on um, bagging and boosting is other boost and gradient boosting. Now we again use uh, tabular data options and we have uh, the training samples data set. We use the same parameters. We exclude uh, the class column from the feature set. And for setting the labels, we again use the same data set. We have headers and then we select it by column name. We also have advanced option here. <clears throat> How many trees um, we can have in the forest? For example, the default value is 100. And there are other different uh, parameters. What should be the depth of the tree? And <clears throat> how many um, samples you need to have uh, on each node? But uh, we are not looking at these uh, options now. Let's run this uh, tool and get um, the predicted uh, model, prediction model from the ensemble method tool. While this tool is running, uh, we can look at this question. What are the advantages of random forest classifier compared to uh, KNN and SVM? <clears throat> so um, random forest classifier is an ensemble method and it takes prediction from many different um, classifiers which are decision trees. Therefore, um, it reduces the problem of um, high variance defined by each decision tree. As we are taking, uh, in, in another way, we are taking the opinion of a committee rather than just one person. Therefore, we tend to be uh, better compared to using just uh, one estimator or one classifier. <clears throat> The random forest uh, algorithm has one attribute as feature importance. It gives um, an importance value to each feature we are using. Therefore, uh, using that knowledge, we can actually exclude uh, those features which are not that relevant for our learning task. Uh, the features having really low values, for example, close to zero, then we can remove those features and uh, use only those features uh, which have high importance values. By that, our data set will become smaller. We have less features and more important features. Therefore, our running time would be better and the accuracy may get better. Um, therefore, it's worth a try to use this um, feature importance values, uh, which is given by a random forest algorithm. Um, our job has finished and we have a trained model from random forest. Now we can do prediction using the same tool. Now we <clears throat> use load and model and predict. We choose random forest classifier and uh, test data as test rows. Now our data set contains header and let's see if we have the same. I just copied uh, the, the actual name of this output file and we just run this tool. <clears throat> With this, we will get a predicted file with the predicted classes and we can we can still do uh, the prediction uh, <clears throat> analysis using the plots and for that we need to use this tool in galaxy we have this 
So now our tool is actually open and we need, sorry, I forgot to rename this data set before, which I'll do it now. And I have renamed this data set. Now I will again open this particular particular uh, plotting tool and we have this input data file as uh, two labels and we have predicted data file as random forest result uh, which is finished just now and then a random forest classifier model then we just run this tool um, we will again get uh, these three plots we have seen before with the other classifiers so we can see our ROC plot uh, in the tutorial itself, and we can see that uh, the accuracy is one, which is like 100% accuracy. We can see that um, <clears throat> we have uh, improved uh, the accuracy with the ensemble method compared to linear and KNN and SVM models. Uh, our jobs are running. So we, we see that um, we have improved uh, the performance using random forest uh, algorithm. You can see the confusion metrics. Uh, for that, we need to collapse this left section. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, in the confusion matrix, as we have expected that um, we have higher number of true positives here and we have zero numbers of of these uh, false uh, these two negatives and uh, this particular uh, box uh, which predicted label as one and true label as zero so in this diagonal uh, there are zeros uh, Previously, we used to have uh, some positive number around 40 or 50, which were wrongly classified. We can also look at the precision recall curve. So here, um, since we are getting the best accuracy, so this precision curve is is all these three lines uh, got merged here. Um, and again, we can see this ROC AUC curve. So um, looking at this curve, we can say that uh, this curve is is at the position which is the leftmost and that gives the best accuracy of one. So this is an ideal uh, prediction. Uh, you, you will see this kind of prediction uh, very less, but uh, you can see maybe sometimes. <clears throat> so this is the ideal uh, prediction and yeah. Till now, uh, we have seen uh, three or four different kinds of algorithms, uh, learning and predicting on the same data, and we are getting different accuracies for each different algorithm. <clears throat> and we have used all these algorithms um, on the default values of all the hyperparameters. We have not optimized any hyperparameter. We have just used those um, as such to see whether we can improve the performance of any algorithm by tuning the hyperparameter uh, we need to use um, search techniques such as grid search or random search for doing that uh, we need to create um, a pipeline builder a pipeline builder is um, is a package uh, which contains uh, some pre-processing steps 
together with uh, the classifier. Um, in this tutorial, we are not discussing any pre-processing techniques. We are just using the data as such. Um, th therefore, our pipeline builder contains only the classifier. Here we are using um, a slightly different uh, classifier, which is a bagging classifier. It, it, it is also based on a bagging approach. It creates um, random um, decision trees, if not set differently and uh, takes majority voting uh, from the predictions of individual decision trees. To use uh, the hyperparameter search technique, uh, let's first uh, try to build this pipeline builder. As I just uh, said before, so Pipeline Builder can package pre-processing steps also sequentially. But since uh, in this tutorial, we are not discussing that, we will just uh, set all the pre-processing steps as none. We are not transforming the data. We are just using the data as it is and just selecting uh, the final estimator. The final estimator is uh, sklearn ensemble uh, because Bagging classifier is one of the algorithms from Ensemble Suite. And then we choose bagging classifier. It's very important um, to be aware that we choose bagging classifier and not bagging regressor. Bagging regressor is used for regression tasks. Since we are doing classification, we must use bagging classifier. Okay. And uh, we are not setting any other parameter. So output the parameters for search CV. Here, <clears throat> by doing this, uh, output parameters for search CV to yes, it will actually um, take out all the parameters, hyperparameters of bagging classifier in a tabular format, which we can use it uh, during hyperparameter optimization. Uh, yes, so we have all the options set and now we are running this tool. Here we will get uh, two data sets. Uh, first is uh, the pipeline and second is uh, the tabular data set containing all the hyperparameters of bagging classifier. Our job is running now. To apply hyperparameters, um, we need to use hyperparameter search tool. And uh, you just see hyperparameter search. Before going into this tool definition, uh, let's see uh, what are the different uh, hyperparameters of, of bagging classifier. So these are the hyperparameters uh, which we can see here. Uh, <clears throat> number of estimators, how many trees we need to use. And uh, these are end jobs, how many uh, cores we want to use uh, for parallel processing. Uh, what should be the base estimator, whether decision trees or some other. And there are, there are others. Uh, these hyperparameters uh, we can actually uh, optimize. And the default values of these hyperparameters are actually written here. Number of estimators is 10. Now let's open the hyperparameter search tool again. <clears throat> so uh, the search technique, um, there are two search techniques, uh, randomized, random search and grid search. 
we discussed it briefly that uh, grid search uses discrete values of each hyperparameter and random search uses um, a range, uses a range and samples values from that range for each hyperparameter. For this tutorial, we will use uh, grid search and we go to the tool definition. We have used the grid search and then we need to use a uh, data set containing pipeline estimator object. So we have this pipeline estimator object. Our model is not a deep learning model, therefore it should be set to no. Now, uh, search parameters build it. We need to use uh, the data set containing all the hyperparameter names. So here we will just use this data set as such to get the names of all. So <clears throat> when we have chosen uh, the names here, uh, this particular data set, we will get a list of all the names uh, in this particular dropdown. So whichever hyperparameter we want to uh, optimize, we can just select it from here. So we want to optimize the number of hyperparameters, number of uh, estimators. Therefore, we will use uh, n estimators. And the default value of this hyperparameter is 10. Now we should specify a search list. It means that uh, the n estimators will be will be using uh, these values uh, one at a time. So if, if it uses uh, the default value, it uses only 10. But since we are optimizing uh, this particular hyperparameter, we have specifies a list. And in each iteration, it will use uh, one value uh, as n estimators and find the accuracy based on that. And whichever is the best it, it reports. Input type uh, is tabular data. Now these options are the same as we have used before. We have training samples data set as train rows. Our data set contains header. We exclude all these uh, target column for taking out only the features. Then we use train rows here and our data set again contains header. We use select columns by this. We copy the same name here. And then we just look at uh, the table definition, uh, whether we have set all the parameters in the right way. It looks right. Whole portion has notes and we want to save the best estimator. This particular uh, tool uh, will find the best um, values of each hyperparameter that we are testing and also uh, corresponding to that best hyperparameter setting it saves the best estimator as well, which we can use uh, later for prediction or for other analyses. Since uh, this tool has many different uh, uh, values to be values to set, therefore we should verify it once so that uh, we are using the right values. Pipeline estimator here, right way, this is right, this estimator is right. If you want to, um, optimize some other hyperparameter as well, then we should select it here and uh, another hyperparameter and we can set uh, this particular hyperparameter and we can set different values for, for max features. Since we are optimizing here only n estimators attribute, uh, we will just uh, delete. We have tabular data here, train rows, yes, it contains header. All columns exclude some column header name class and train rows again. We have header, set a column by header names and class. We want to include 
this is none find best estimator now we just execute this tool Our jobs have started running here. So <clears throat> it is it will give uh, two data sets. Uh, one is the fitted estimator, which is the best uh, model for us, corresponding to the best hyperparameter. And the other one is a tabular data, which gives uh, the performance um, for each uh, combination of hyperparameter that we have set. So it will have a, a performance uh, accuracy for each of these values of n estimators. And from that table, we can see that uh, which of them performs the best. To again um, use the prediction um, <clears throat> as before, we need to use ensemble method for classification and regression tool because uh, in the pipeline, we have used a bagging classifier, which is an ensemble method. Therefore, we need to use ensemble method for, for prediction uh, with this model. Since uh, this job is already yellow, we can again queue up one more job and use uh, the still unfinished data sets. Uh, so um, the job already got finished. Let's look at this tabular data set returned by. Uh, we can see that there are many different columns in this particular data set. Let's look at the tabular data set uh, returned by the hyperparameter optimization tool. In this tabular data set, there are several columns. For example, what is the mean fit time and scoring time, the prediction time, what is the, uh, the test score, and uh, test score is the accuracy against uh, each hyperparameter value. We have used um, n estimators as the hyperparameter whose value needs to be optimized. And for each uh, value, we get one uh, test score or accuracy score. And these are also ranked based on the accuracy here. So n estimators equal to five gets uh, the best accuracy followed by uh, the default value of n estimators, which is 10 and then uh, 20 and 50 gives gets the same accuracy. Makes no difference uh, to increase the number of trees. There are further uh, columns. Um, <clears throat> for ex further columns, for example, these columns uh, refer to the the cross validation splits accuracy corresponding to cross validation splits. We can see here that. Um, we are getting a better accuracy when we change uh, the hyperparameter value and not using uh, it at the default value. Therefore, it's always important uh, to verify if we can get better accuracy by optimizing these hyperparameters. We can use uh, different combinations of hyperparameters. For simplicity, we have just used one, but you can use uh, different uh, hyperparameters. And then you will have uh, different accuracy scores in all versus all combination. Since we have used only four values, we have only four different accuracy scores. We also got um, the best model corresponding to uh, an estimator equal to five, which we can use it for prediction. For doing that, uh, we will use the same tool uh, I think uh, we already know uh, we don't have it right now. Uh, 
So we will find this tool. Ensemble methods. And now we need to uh, predict a model. Then uh, we will use this particular estimator, the best estimator that we received from the hyperparameter optimization tool. And then we use the test data. And our test data contains header. We just check uh, whether we have applied the same values. So a zipped file. Um, so our model is actually a zipped file. So we have put it here and we have uh, test rows and our data set contains header. Now we will predict using uh, the new model that we have. So as long as it's not finishing, uh, we can see the results uh, in this particular plot. Confusion matrix, um, if you remember, uh, we were seeing um, a bluish value uh, in this particular box. But now we are seeing a yellowish uh, color here, which means that uh, based on this color bar, which means that it has the number increased from here to here, which is a good sign. And we are getting better accuracy compared to uh, previous uh, algorithms that we used. So uh, our job just got started. Let's look at uh, the the precision and recall curve. We can also see that uh, precision also improved uh, for both the classes, uh, class one and uh, class zero. And also uh, the recall is also higher, which gives a much better overall score. Now we have uh, the predicted uh, data set. Uh, to plot it, uh, we will use the same tool. Um, let's find uh, the name of the tool here. And we just find this tool. So we have this tool. We, our input data is uh, test row labels. And this is our predicted data set here. And we have the best model here. We just run this tool. Again, we will get uh, the same three plots, which we saw here. Again, uh, we can see that um, the AUC curve um, here, we are getting the best accuracy. And this is the ideal uh, curve for ROC. And <clears throat> the accuracy is, is 100%. Um, our jobs are running now. So in the, in the previous steps, uh, we did not uh, rename these data sets at all. Um, but uh, when you do analyses, uh, it's always good to rename these data sets and not use uh, the default values uh, to avoid confusion. Uh, it's always good uh, to rename these data sets. We have seen uh, these plots. Um, so once these jobs finish, we'll see the similar plots in Galaxy. Uh, with this, uh, we come to the conclusion of this tutorial. We have seen um, many different uh, classifiers working on the same data, but producing different results. It means that uh, these algorithms uh, treat the data in a different way. 
therefore it's always important uh, to try out different algorithms on on your data set to see uh, which one works the best whether you need only a linear classifier or you need a very complicated one like svm or random forest or some other algorithm it's always good uh, to start with the simple algorithm and see um, if the algorithm is performing good and then move on to more complex ones and see if we are getting better accuracies and then we do hyperparameter optimization uh, of the algorithm and still see uh, if you are doing better. So uh, this is one of the uh, good um, good suggestions uh, to use simpler algorithm first and then move on to more complicated ones. We have used um, the data set with only two classes, but you can use um, a data set with multiple classes as well, which will be a multi-class classification and see um, how good you are doing for each class. You see the performance using the visualization tools, how good your um, algorithm is performing and how good you are doing uh, for each class, which is also very important. Uh, if you are doing very good for one class and not good for the other, then probably the data needs to be balanced in some way. And we have specified um, only three or four algorithms, but you can, in the machine learning suite in Galaxy, there are many different algorithms also, which can be tried out on the same data to see if we can do better. Meanwhile, uh, the job has finished and we can see the plots as i've said uh, the plots are bigger in size therefore it takes some time to load you can see uh, the size of the plot is 3 mb it takes some time a few seconds to load Uh, <clears throat> we see uh, the same plot here. Um, this I remember for logistic regression is used to be 508, but now it is 549. And this used to be, I guess, for 247, around 240s, which has also increased. And we can see uh, there are some misclassified values also. Uh, the six uh, samples. Uh, having two levels as one are predicted as zero and in this one uh, the true level is zero but uh, it's predicted as one so uh, but they are very few see the uh, the prediction rate is really high and uh, we can see the minimum uh, minimum recall for class is around 0.98 is 98 percent this is good accuracy and the roc curve is 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 very good and uh, it's it's 100 percent uh... with these uh, tools you can um, use on many data sets and uh, try out different algorithms, different uh, pre-processing techniques also, uh, which we have not used. You can use it in the pipeline tool. Also, you can uh, mix it with uh, different um, estimators and see um, if you're doing good or better. With this, um, I will conclude uh, the classification tutorial. I hope you have learned something at the end of the tutorial, you will find a feedback section. Let us improve uh, the content of the tutorial by giving your invaluable feedback. Thanks a lot.